Uh, but hey, my name is Caleb. If you're new here, uh, we're so glad you're here. And uh, my wife and I have had the pleasure of pastoring this church since its inception, uh, going on 11 years in January. That's crazy. And uh, God's been good. If you are looking around going, man, things look a little different today. It's like I seen flowers in the lobby. We just finished, for the first time in the history of Project Church, five, th today is five straight days of church, um, which we have never done because we just had our fashion women's conference. But Wednesday night was presence night, worship night, at our South Sac campus. Thursday night, fashion. Friday night, fashion. All day yesterday, Saturday, fashion women's conference. And so five straight days, counting today, of church. And man, I'm loving life. I'm not even tired, church. Supernatural energy. Uh, and I'm feeling a little feminine. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I was with the ladies all week. Uh, but I'm actually rocking one of the shirts and uh, this is a fashion show. Actually, there's a little bit more merch left available if you want to get some. There's hats. I think there's. I think the shirts might be all gone, but uh, there's hats left and maybe a couple hoodies so you can stop in after service and maybe grab some church merch. Uh, but hey, we are kicking off an all-new series today called The Parable Project. We're going to explore the riches of Jesus' stories. If you don't know, Jesus actually shared 40 parables. These are stories. 40 parables with us in the Gospels that we have on record. Um, we know that Jesus, it says, if, if all of his words were recorded, it wouldn't, it, they would fill every book in every library in the world. And that's pretty incredible to think about. But we have his 40 parables, these 40 parables recorded because the, the apostles, they, they could remember those more easily. I mean, you know, stories are more easily remembered. And so what we're going to do is seven weeks, seven parables or seven stories that we're going to look at. Some are more prominent, um, ones you've heard. Some are less well-known, including today. Actually, today's parable, I have never heard a sermon preached on it. I have never personally taught a message or preached on this parable. And so I'm excited to share it with you. It will also be the shortest of all the parables that we look at. Now, I wanna set this up and even the shortness of this parable by bringing you back to some American history. Anybody like history in this place? Um, you're a history fan, history buff. So in 1863, uh, Abraham Lincoln gave an address that has gone down in history and in infamy known as the Gettysburg Address. So it was November of 1863, and Abraham Lincoln went to Gettysburg for a memorial that was being built to those who had given their lives in Gettysburg on that battlefield. But what many of you don't know, in fact, I didn't know, uh, is that Abraham Lincoln was not the primary speaker of the day. He was not given the challenge of being the principal speaker. In fact, a man named Edward Everett was considered one of the greatest public speakers of the day, and he was the primary speech bringer or giver of that day. And, and so he went first, and he gave a two-hour speech. Two hours. Some of you are like, dang. And that's how long I'm going to preach today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> A two-hour speech, which was the norm in this day. And when he finished, Abraham Lincoln followed him. Abraham Lincoln got up and gave a speech that was 276 words in length and took a little over two minutes to give. And when he finished this, Edward Everett declared, and actually was in the paper the next day, he was so moved by Abraham Lincoln's speech that he said, this speech by Abraham Lincoln will live on for generations and mine will be forgotten. And he was right. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln giving this speech four score and seven years ago gave a two minute speech that has gone down in infamy and maybe many people consider one of the five most powerful speeches ever recorded in human history, and it took two minutes to deliver. Why am I telling you this? Because this is one of, and actually the shortest parable that we're going to look at, but it is incredibly powerful. 
It is a brief parable that I would like to kick off this series with. So if you have Luke, or if you have your Bibles, go to Luke chapter 13. Um, it will be on the giant Bible behind me as well, or you can pull out your phones. Um, we're good with that too. Who's got a real Bible? Just hold it up. Uh, look at these. Real, these are the really spiritual people in the room. There's like five of them. They love Jesus more than the rest of you. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I actually read my Bible on my phone every single day. Um, but I love to preach from this. So here we go. And he told this parable, he being Jesus. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Everybody say, ew. <laughs> then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of the Lord. The shortest parable that we will look at in these seven weeks. Now, I want to give you some context because we can't just read this parable and just be like, all right, here's what it means without looking at the context in which Jesus is sharing it. And so I'm actually going to take you to the beginning of chapter 13 and I want to read starting in verse number one leading up to this parable. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So just so you know, just a, a short while before this, Pilate, who was the Roman ruler in this area, had murdered a bunch of Galileans. And they tell Jesus about it. And he answered them, again, he being Jesus, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. This is also well known in this day. This tower fell and killed 18 people who were walking by. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then Jesus tells them this story about the barren fig tree. So this gives us a little bit more context as to where and how Jesus is framing this very short but powerful, interesting story that he shares with them. And so what I want to do is I want to talk to you about how Jesus is referring to us all here as trees. So I said, look at your neighbor and tell him your branches look good. Because we, the trees is the title of my message. We, the trees. So what I wanna do is I wanna share three thoughts with you as it relates to the heart of Jesus towards us, his trees. The first is this. He is looking at our branches. Did you know this? Like Jesus is looking at your life He's looking at your branches. God doesn't save us and then leaves us. He saves us to use us. He has saved you to then use you for his purposes, to make you the, the light in the darkness, the salt in a world that has lost its saltiness, to be his hands and his feet, his mouthpiece for him. He saves us to use us. And I like Jesus in this moment, and profoundly concerned with what I'm seeing in the American church. You see, Jesus was profoundly concerned with what he was seeing of the Jewish people. And I am profoundly concerned with what I'm seeing in the local church. My concern is that there are many people, maybe even in this room, who are not fully surrendered or converted to Jesus Christ. My concern this Sunday and every Sunday is that there are some of you who have not had an authentic repentance towards God in your heart. And I know you're going, whoa, Caleb, is this where you're going with this? Like hellfire and brimstone? Yes, I am. Let's get ready. Buckle your seatbelts. 
Jesus clearly states, if you don't repent, you will perish. You will die. If you don't repent, this is what is coming. And so people, they love to talk to me about Jesus. They're like, oh man, I just love Jesus because he's so grace-filled and loving. And, and, and he just encouraged people all the time. And, and that's why I like Jesus. He's not that judgmental type like the, local, like the church is today. And I'm like, y'all haven't really read Jesus' teachings then. Y'all haven't really read the whole gospel of, of, of Jesus Christ. Because when I read it, yes, he is loving and grace-filled, but he is also a just uh, uh, example of God for this world. And he clearly says, if you don't repent, you will perish. And then he tells the story of a tree that isn't bearing fruit and says, take it and rip it out. Amen. Cut it down. Get rid of it. It is not bearing any fruit. We were made to bear fruit. And God is looking at our branches. Do you hear me today, church? So many Christians, they say, I like Jesus as Savior. But we just don't like him as Lord. Like, I like the Jesus that saves me from hell. But the Jesus that I got to surrender my whole life to and live in obedience to. And to his word, like, I'll, 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 I'll leave that Jesus. Give me the Jesus that just saves me from punishment. Now, let me give some theological terms, because I think a lot of Christians are living this kind of life. Let me give you some theological terms of this type of repentance. Theologically speaking, there are two types of repentance. The first type of repentance is the repentance of attrition. Everybody say attrition. This is the type of repentance that is motivated uh, by the fear of punishment. So I just need that get out of hell ticket. I just need to be saved from punishment. It's the repentance of Esau. It's the repentance of your kids who get caught, like taking that cookie when you said no cookies before dinner, and they get caught, and they're like, I'm so sorry, don't spank me. Or my kids, I'm so sorry, don't take away my Switch. <laughs> Nintendo Switch, that is. Don't take away Fortnite, Dad. Don't do that to me. They are, they have attrition, right? They're sorry because they don't want to be punished. And I think there's a lot of Christians living this way. Can I tell you something? This type of repentance never leads to true salvation. Because there's not a heart change. Like, oh, I'm sorry, and I'm not going to do it again, but it's just because I don't want to be punished. Now, the second theological term or type of repentance is the term of contrition. Everybody say contrition. It's why the Bible talks about having a contrite heart before God. This is when our hearts are broken from our sin, and we are grieved at the fact that we have hurt God. That we have gone against God and we have grieved his heart. This is the type of true repentance that leads to true salvation. This is why when I talk to my kids and, and, and they mess up and, and they, they, I mean, my kids are perfect, but your kids, let's talk about your kids. Um, when your kids mess up, I'm joking. Uh, when my kids mess up and I say to them, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. And I remember my parents saying this to me, and that's like the worst thing to hear. Why? Because I realized I didn't just, I'm, I'm not just avoiding punishment, and that's why I'm sorry. I actually hurt their heart. And that's the type of repentance we need in the church, where we are grieved at the fact that we have grieved God's heart, that he has something better for us, and it pains him when he watches us walk this kind of wrong living out. That's the type of repentance Jesus wants for his church. A contrite heart. My heart is broken that I have hurt God. And you know what happens when we have this kind of repentance? These people are reconciled to God forever. 
So when I'm talking about your branches, God is looking at your branches and Jesus is calling the Jewish people to repentance and he's calling us to repentance. We need branches and fruit of repentance in the church. When we took over Streamline Church, which is now we're turning into our South Sac campus, it happened six weeks ago. And, and I am not a person that carries stress or anxiety. Like my whole life, I think I just have that laid back, chill personality, which has served me well in leading this church because nothing really bothers me. Nothing phases me. I'm always like, it's all good. God's got it. Like things could be falling apart. I'm like, we're good. God's good. We're good. But something happened six weeks ago when we took over this campus. I was met with, for the first time in my life, overwhelming anxiety. And for five weeks, I have carried, up until last Sunday, I carried overwhelming anxiety. I'm talking about, I sleep like a baby. All five weeks, I'm waking up at two in the morning, three in the morning, five in the morning. I can't sleep. My heart is racing. I was walking my kids home from school one day, and I'm thinking about everything and all the weight of this. And, and out of nowhere, my heart just starts going like 100 miles an hour. I had to stop, tell my kids, hold on, stop, and, and get my breath. This wasn't a physical thing. I knew what was happening. There was anxiety overwhelming me. So for the first time in my life, I can empathize with some of you. You're like, now you know what it feels like, Caleb. God's teaching me things in, this, in my 40s now, church. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. But it was crazy. So last Sunday, I didn't preach here. I only preached at the Southside campus. And I got up at the Southside campus that Sunday. And, and, and I have an issue, which some of you have, is that I don't tell people when I'm struggling. And this is an issue because God told us to bear one another's burdens. God told us we need the intercessions of the saints and the other believers around us. But I've been this, I've had this mentality like, it's my, it's my weight to bear. I got to shoulder it. I'm the leader. I don't want to put this on anyone else to the point where I wasn't even telling my wife. I'm dealing with overwhelming anxiety and I'm telling no one. And last Sunday, it wasn't in my notes, but I just started telling them about it. And then in the middle of my sermon, I just said, church, I, I, I'm going to just prophesy over myself right now. And I just begin to speak out, out. In Jesus' name, I prophesy. I break off the spirit of fear and anxiety and stress. And I ask it to kneel and bend the knee at the mighty name of Jesus. And then I begin to speak it out over the church. And some of you, God's breaking it off in this place. And I kid you not, that night I slept great. And for seven days straight, I have had zero anxiety anxiety. Zero. Why am I telling you this? Because this is the branches and the fruit that bears when we walk in the truth of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And some of us need to prophesy over ourselves. Some of us need to ask for some prayer and get people around us to lift us up. And what's crazy was because I declared it, the word spread. And next thing I know, our prayer warriors and our church and my wife are praying for me and boom, the spirit of fear is broken off me. God is moving. God wants to, to, to prune us. And this was some pruning for me because God's teaching me, Caleb, you got to learn to be vulnerable. Because my, my natural bent is not vulnerability, church. My natural bent is I got it all together. I'm the man. I got this. I don't need anyone. I don't need to tell anyone. But God is pruning my branches, and he wants to prune you so you can bear better fruit. Which leads us to the second heart of Jesus towards his trees, is that you were made to bear fruit. I need to declare something over this church right now. We've been in seasons for the last 10 years of preparation, but I believe that this year, year 10, and going into the next decade is that it is fruit-bearing season. No longer are we waiting. Our roots have gone deep. We have planted seeds. We have watered. It is fruit-bearing season for your life, for this church, for this ministry, and for this future. And I just felt like as I was preparing, God told me to tell you, it is fruit bearing season. Some of you have been waiting on the fruit and he wanted me to declare, it's fruit bearing season. You've been waiting on God. The fruit is coming. Believe it and speak to it. You see, the main means of God 
and his saving process is in and through the church. It's in and through the local church, but not just like being here on Sunday mornings. It's in and through the local church being the local church when it leaves these doors. And so I, 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 there was a quote that I heard preached a lot, and I've even preached it, and it goes like this. Preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. And I was like, oh, that's, that's so good, and I preached it before. But you see, here's the problem with that. The point comes in every connection and gospel encounter where you have to use your words to declare the truth of the gospel. Like the good news of Jesus Christ is not gonna be learned by some of them just watching you like, oh wow, he's really cool and nice and loves and there's something different about him. And they go, what's different about you? And you go, well, I don't use words. <laughs> what's different about you? I, I don't use words. I just, it's just my life. Yeah, but what is it about your life? You see, the time comes. Yes, your life should point people to something different. But the time comes where you must use your words to declare the good news that you have. Here's what scripture tells us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We must declare the words of God from the word of God for people to be changed and transformed by the gospel. And so my challenge to us, I think some of us, we, we are... Our lives have been like, well, I'm going to bear fruit just by how I live. But God, I think, is challenging our church. The fruit-bearing season is that many of us are being called to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with our words, with our neighbors, and our friends, and our family members, and those people we come across uh, uh, on the street and at the grocery store. I believe this week you're going to have gospel encounters, God encounters, where he's going to give you opportunity not to just live great, but to speak the truth that Jesus is the good news. That he's the answer. I think the fruit bearing that I'm declaring over this church is salvation for people that you never thought could be saved. And it's salvation for people that maybe you've even written off. Too far gone. Too sinful. Too broken. And God's going to use you to speak the truth of the good news of Jesus over their life. And they're going to respond and repent with contrition. And their lives are going to be changed. This is a parable of repentance. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's giving this short four verse or, or three verse parable of repentance. And I, I was reading it and I'm like, man, a fig tree in a vineyard, that doesn't make sense. Right, because a vineyard is for vines. We're, we're close to Napa, so we get it. Vineyard is for vines, and the vines grow grapes, and then they turn the grapes into wine, and they made wine back then. And so they understood this. But what we don't know is this letter, or, or this scripture, th this story was being told to an ancient Jewish listener 2,000 years ago. And they would have known that the best place to grow grapes is also the best place to plant any fruit tree. And so what was common practice in this day is they had a vineyard, but they would also plant all sorts of other fruit trees because that's where the soil was best and it's where uh, the, the, the trees were best and most cared for. So it was normal in this day for these trees to be planted in vineyards. What's the point? The point is this. You need to be planted in good places. And I'm encouraging you today because I believe God has brought you to a healthy church in a healthy environment with good soil because he's wanting you to plant yourself so you can grow and bear much fruit. So I believe that God has called Project Church to be a healthy, tree-growing, fruit-bearing church. And that's why we must be planted in the house of God. So people online, let me come for him for a minute. People online. This is a great alternative. You can't be here. You're sick. You're, you're, you're on a trip. You can watch online. That's amazing. But there's nothing like being in the house because in the presence and the power of God is released in the house. And so be here in the room. Okay, I'm done coming for you. Back to y'all in the room. No, there's something powerful about being here because the soil 
it, 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 it's more fertile when you're in the room. I've just seen it. God can still use that. He still uses online. They're watching online right now on YouTube and Facebook. and That's great. He still uses it. But there's something more fertile when you're here in the body of believers. And God begins to just infill you with right, good nutrients so that you can bear the fruit necessary to live your life in this world. But on this fig tree, he found no fruit. You know that Jesus, throughout his teaching, is constantly concerned with us bearing good fruit. He says it over and over in his teaching. You must bear fruit. You must be fruit bearers. You must have good fruit. He gives us the fruits of the Spirit. He calls us to be fruit bearers. He's concerned with it. And he teaches it. But fruit bearing is not always comfortable, is it? You know... Uh, we had the fashion women's conference uh, this weekend, and yesterday, my wife asked me to do like a skit for the ladies, and so they're already laughing because some of them, some of them saw it. If you missed it, you can go on Instagram. You'll see it. Caleb D. Cole, follow me. Um, but but I did this like jazzercise spiritual workout for the ladies. We called it Lit and Fit for the Lord, and. Uh, and it was extra, and I was acting crazy out of pocket and uh, dancing, and it, it was wild. If you missed it, I'm sorry. You'll be blessed. But, but one of our friends took a video of my daughter during it. And my daughter, I saw it. She was just the whole time, like, watching like this, like, oh, my gosh. YouTube, zoom in on my face like this. Oh. And then at the very end, in the video, she's in the room. She's right here in the room watching me perform. She goes, it's so cringe. <laughs> she's eight. I walk out. The second the service ends, she comes over to me. And she's still got the look on her face. She's like, Dad, why would you do that? I said, because when Mommy asks, Daddy delivers. <laughs> Come on, husbands, this is a word from the Lord. Be a man that delivers. But it's funny that even at eight years old, she's concerned with what people think. She's concerned with how I look to all the people that are watching. At eight years old, she cares about man's opinion. And this is a reminder for us that many of us are not bearing fruit because we're more concerned with what man says than what God says. Some of us are not bearing fruit in our lives because we care about man's opinion more than God's opinion. And so I got to challenge you. You want to bear fruit? You got to get over what the world thinks, what the world says, what people might say about you, how they might talk about you. You got to get over it and step into the obedience of who God is calling you to be. And that's a fruit bearer. But I was studying this and I, I got to the end of it. And I even told you to say, ew. And the vine dresser is talking with the owner of the vineyard. And the owner of the vineyard says, cut this tree down. It's been here for three years, and it has yet to bear any fruit. But the vine dresser says, give me one more year. I'm going to dig a, a, a ditch around it. I'm going to put in manure. And we know manure is fertilizer, right? I'm going to put in fertilizer. And then if in a year it still hasn't bear fruit, we can do what we want. We can rip it out. And it was just a reminder for me that, that often bearing fruit is not comfortable. I need you to hear this because some of you have been in patterns and cycles of unhealth for years, for decades. In fact, it may be generational. It's a generational curse that goes back to your parents and your parents' parents. And when God has to prune you and fertilize you and plant you and change you, it's not going to be comfortable. But it's necessary for you to step into the fruit bearing that God has for you. So what we do is when things are uncomfortable, we quit. I don't like it. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't smell well. But I got to tell you, 
You were made to bear fruit. And in order to bear fruit, God's going to have to put you through some uncomfortable pruning. Some uncomfortable fertilizing. Some uncomfortable changes. So you can be molded and break off the generational curses and the cycles of sin and become all that God has called you to be. And the final heart of Jesus towards his trees is that he is advocating for us. You hear me? You have an advocate in Jesus. The Bible tells us that he sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Did you know that Jesus is praying for you? Think about this. The Son of God. The Messiah, the Savior come in the form of a man, sacrificed himself, gave his life, and then ascended to the right hand of the Father, and now prays for you. He knows you. He cares about your life. You see, he actually goes the extra mile to help us bear fruit. What happens to the fig tree? What happens to the fig tree? What happens to the fig tree? We don't know. Year three comes, three years of no fruit. And the vine dresser says, give me one more year. Let me dig this ditch. Let me put in some fertilizer. And then we'll see if it bears fruit. Yes, good and well. But if not, we'll cut it down. But I started to think about it. What happens in the fourth year? I want you to think about this. Did the fourth year finally make the difference? After the fourth year, was there fruit or was it still barren and fruitless? You see, Jesus is using this parable to amplify the experience of the people in this city. He's using this parable to tell them, you must repent and do it now. He's telling them, if you don't, you too will perish. This isn't a repent someday. This is now is the time. This may be your last opportunity. This may be it. So I beg you, some of you in this room, you've been running from God. I beg you, I, I, I implore you that you don't let this day go by without truly repenting. Oh, this wasn't the message that you thought you would hear today, but it's the message that God sent me to deliver, that you would take advantage of the blessed assurance, the blessed redemption that comes to all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And may this be a fruit-bearing church. But my encouragement to you today, as I ask you and call, some of you need to repent in this place. Not a popular topic, but one that we need and we need to be reminded of and one that Jesus delivered multiple times. But my encouragement to you today is that you have an advocate in Jesus. You see, this isn't just on you. It's not just about you. You have an advocate in Jesus. First John 2, 1 says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So here's what I want to, I just want to encourage you with, I want to send you out here with. The vine dresser, I believe in this story, is Jesus. And he hasn't given up on you. In fact, right now he's saying, just one more year. Just give them one more year. I'm not giving up on them. I'm advocating for them. I'm praying for them. I'm bringing fertilizer to them because I believe they can still bear fruit. And that same advocate went to that cross and he advocated for us even then when on the cross he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Today in this place, I'm imploring you that you would allow the advocate Jesus to be not just your Savior, but also your Lord. For some of you, you've let year after year go by and Jesus hasn't given up on you. He's advocating for you on behalf of you to the master and the owner of the field. And he's saying to him right now, one more year. I believe that fruit is coming. 
So with heads bowed and eyes closed all around this room, you're here, you say, Caleb, that's me. I've been running from God. I turned my back on him and I need to truly repent. Maybe you've repented out of attrition in the past, but you need to repent out of contrition right now. And today you know that your tree has not bared good fruit, but you're ready to be planted, rooted in the things of God like never before. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand right now in this place. You need Jesus in your life. Hands going up all around the room. Pray this with me. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Take away my sin. Come into my life. Thank you for advocating for me. I need you to lead me. I surrender to you as my Lord and my Savior. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Come on, stand to your feet, church. Give God some praise for what he's doing in this place.